It's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Alice Penning from Teltares with me today. And she's one of the star uh, scientists working on river restoration, on nature-based solutions and many other things. And I'm very happy that you are here. Thank you for joining, Alice. Maybe, maybe as a starting point, could you present yourself, your CV shortly, what your background is and what you are working in? Yeah, no, so I'm a, an ecologist by training and I work at Deltares in the Freshwater Ecosystems and Water Quality Group. And I am responsible for the research on nature-based solutions. And from that perspective, I personally work a lot in the freshwater nature-based solutions uh, domain. I coordinate the EU project Spongescapes, which is about uh, water retention measures uh, in the smaller streams and catchments. And at the same time, I'm mm -hmm. part of the steering committee in the Merlin EU project, which is about freshwater restoration and how you upscale that. Very good. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Now, to come to the nature-based solutions, for example, uh, how would you define nature-based solutions and why do you think it's so important for us in the future to go with those measures? So, like, if we're talking about nature-based solutions, there's a really nice definition that was made by the United Nations Environmental Assembly that I always just refer to. It's a rather long definition, but it's good to especially emphasize the last part of that definition, which says, Nature-based solution is there to provide both human well-being and at the same time also a net biodiversity gain. So in, in seeing that, it, uh, that it will help different goals. So both uh, working towards the restoration of ecosystems for the sake of the ecosystem itself, but also for some of the human functions that we are relying on in that ecosystem, may it be flood reduction or resistance and resilience to droughts or helping with other aspects, um, that is something that the nature-based solutions are there to cater for. Very good definition. So in the context now of river restoration, also the restoration law is discussed in the European Union these days, yeah. very, very controversially. How, how would you see the role of nature-based solution in the overall context of river restoration? So what role do they play there, you think? Well, we have to realize that rivers <clears throat> are obviously um, areas of large interest not only for nature but also for human use and different sectors are really relying on them and from that perspective this dual definition of that, that what we're talking about this dual this dual aspect in nature-based solutions in providing both human benefits and the biodiversity gain automatically makes that they are a logic choice to consider when you're talking about river restoration because you can bring in stakeholders that might have very different objectives than just the restoration as such. Very good. Um, could you could you mention, for example, a project uh, which would highlight this importance of nature-based solution or which would, would showcase basically the success of the application of nature-based solution to river restoration? Would you have an example for this that illustrates this? Yeah, well, there's always the, the, the very famous one from the Netherlands, where I am from, of, of course, <laughs> is the room for the river. I mean, it's the logic one to talk about. Yeah, it, was a, it was an initiative that is very large scale. It was really made there uh, with a perspective of both flood management and of increasing the natural values in the river systems. And by providing these different sets of measures underlying that general concept, but saying that if you do this at a landscape scale and you're able to restore, keeping in mind also these different functions, then you are really being a, yeah, working towards a very successful method in doing this. What would you see as special with the project Room for the Rivers? Or what would you see as unique about this? Uh, how would you characterize the special uniqueness uh, of this project, for example? Yeah, I think what's not well, perhaps spatial uniqueness is one because it's it's encompassing the whole river systems of the Netherlands. But what is even more unique, I think, is the time scale, okay. and um, it it implementing large scale measures takes time, and this is something that is always challenging. If we're thinking of like what, what was causing the, the actually the, the the start of the thinking about room for the rivers, that's floods that were occurring in the in the in the nineties. And only, and it's taken about like 25 years to really implement that entire project. 
with the different measures in different locations. But part of that whole timing was also discussing with the stakeholders on what measure do we select and where do we select it and how do we organize that and how do we design them together with the stakeholders and keeping their benefits and their concerns in mind as well. And this is something that this, this time aspect is uh, is important, especially if you're in a, in a country where there are perhaps also uh, political overturns in government that might yeah. make make a big challenge sometimes in this. Yeah, that's a very good point. We have elections seen recently and also in Australia elections. So this is all in all countries the case. Which lection, lessons or what lessons uh, did you learn, you think, based on your project for the next step? Well, I think there's always lessons to be learned, right? We we say this was a very successful, large-scale program, but you can always also further optimize because if we're seeing now that with climate change, droughts are also becoming an important thing to consider. And especially, for example, the, the long-term predictions in these droughts, also due to changes in, uh, in water availability in the summer times, it will not only longer affect the, the flooding aspects that we are working on in river management, but it will also, for example, affect navigation or the accessibility for producing drinking water or cooling water for intakes of, of different uh, factories. So we see that the challenges are becoming much wider and much more integrated. And this, this is something that we see that, okay, if we want to talk again about how to further um, improve the river restoration, we don't only look at the floods anymore, but also at the low water aspects yes. that are yes. related to that. Very good. Yeah, exactly. So um, if we take your approach that you just uh, described in the Netherlands and say, uh, what would you see as transferable to other regions, to the Danube Basin, to other basins? What is transferable about your work, experience and the outcomes of this work from the Netherlands? What, what pieces you can transfer, you think? <clears throat> yeah, well, I think that the, the the overarching concept of providing room for rivers so that they can respond and they can breathe with the different times of the year and the amount of water that is available at that moment in time is an important key factor. And providing that room is as a basic concept you can do in many regions where we have been like restricting rivers in a large in a large way, and. Taking that concept to another context will obviously make that 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 local local details will change, but it doesn't do harm to the overarching concept. That's very important that you mentioned this. So um, if you look into the success or critical development sometimes of our recent river systems in Europe or globally, then we must see that we do a lot of efforts also in our country in Austria, but also in other countries to restore the rivers and still if you look into the numbers for example of the good ecological status you see that the improvement is not that big as you would expect uh, concerning the number of restoration projects that were done there are nice papers now in nature and other journals that describe this fatigue or whatever plateau we reach and we don't get forward we still have extinction of, of, of species and so on so what, what what would be the reason to your point of view why we don't make so much progress despite we have all these ideas. What is the reason for this? Would you have any explanation for the difference of doing things but not reaching the goals completely? Yeah, but I think there's many different reasons for that. And it will also depend for a river yeah. for a river on what is the real cause of that. But we always have we're working in, in systems, ecosystems that are under multiple stresses. Right, it's not only uh, the the amount of habitats that is available, which is often one thing that we are easily working with in restoring that, but it might also be timing of flood frequencies or the, the or yeah, um, it may be the quality of the water. There there may be very there might be disturbance due to navigation. Um, for example, we've seen that like very young fish can really be harmed by ship waves if they are if they are hitting the shorelines, for example. So there's there's very many different types of reasons that underlay why it takes more time. There may be in exotic species that have come mm. in because they've mm. connected river systems. Um, so it's it is understandable that it takes time, and it doesn't 
it shouldn't be a, a, a reason for stopping what we're doing and trying to restore, because if we don't, things will even get worse. So we, rather than the plateau, you might even get a, 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 yeah. a move downwards again. Um, could there be also some reason, I'm just asking because of my experience in this, yeah. that to some extent, uh, when it comes to the evaluation of the status of rivers, but also when it comes to the planning of restoration measures, not necessarily always we find out the major problematic parameter, for example, which is the key topic. And if this is not solved, like in a human being, if you have an illness and you have 25 parameters, and let's say all of them are on the average value, one is very bad, but you average them out completely, you don't find this one parameter, like for example, sediment discontinuity or whatever you have there, or, or hydro peaking. If this is the major dominating process or different of those, uh, could it be that we sometimes don't find those? And for this reason, maybe the cause effect relations are not fully uh, worked on, or maybe there are some other reasons. How, how do you see this if to find out the, the right process behind the well, problem? Well, I, I think we often know the processes and we also know what are the big bottlenecks. But if, if the bottleneck is a big hydropower dam in, 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 in stopping fish migration, for example, <laughs> You know that we also have to consider that this is a sustainable source of energy. So you get yes. into uh, a situation where we have different goals with society, and mm -hmm. sometimes they may be conflicting. And that is also in the in the in this case. And it might also be that we say, listen, we see that navigation is a rather sustainable way of transport, but mm -hmm. this also has its its consequences. So there there is this. And this is more of a political debate as well, rather than a scientific debate in that, like, what are the choices that we make and how do we make that we feel that we're making the most responsible choices in that? Would you, would you see, like we jointly discussed in the Daniel Fall project, for example, this wing to NBS and HFS solutions on the one side, which is really a thing we should go for, at the same time to say we want to reach two goals at the same time, because you mentioned hydropower and environment. So to have a set of measures that try to to improve both things, maybe not 100% reaching all the goals of individual sectors, maybe, but in total to get an improvement. As well. So how would you see this idea to get the age of best solutions for different aims at the same time? Well, I think that like one thing that is um, well, let me let me put it this way: we are in the in the Merlin projects. We are really in the Merlin project, which is another EU project. We are looking into how can we achieve multiple goals, and this is the different types of green deal goals that that are out there. So, for example, are we working towards biodiversity and floods, or sustainable transport and energy and uh, human well-being and green growth, and seeing like how we can combine that and. I think that the, 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 the essence of the nature based solution does provide that. And it is good that when we are making management strategies that we say, okay, what are our overarching goals and which are the different pieces of the puzzle that we can lay together to make that overarching strategy as biodiverse as possible or as contributing as much as possible to all of these goals in a, in, in a joint manner. And for that, um, we do see that there are efforts to really do this. And it is about saying, okay, we want such a scenario on the tables, like what, not only focusing on a single goal, not only focusing on only the, or only navigation, only uh, like drinking water. I mean, it can be all of the, all of the different functions that we are talking about, but seeing them in harmony. And that yeah. harmony brings out that, that we have wins for the different goals as well. That really makes sense what you say. Um, in that context, if you take this up and say, okay, we would have much money, let's say, to do it, hopefully, in the future, uh, then some other question arises to me, at least, in some of the projects I'm in. Um, that means, for example, the scale of the measures, because we discuss a lot, is it uh, good or not good, or does it help a lot if you restore the riverbank? for a few hundred meters for a very big river like the Danube or the Rhine or the Elbe or whatever. In other words, um, does scale matter? Is the scale important? I mean, the spatial scale, maybe also the temporal scale. And I think partially you mentioned this before already, but for me, the question is, do we have a sort of minimum dimension of restoration measures in order to get a real bigger step forward? Or could we say it doesn't matter because if we have enough small measures and we add them up, we have a total summary 
of impact in a positive sense? How would you see the scaling effects? Yeah, you know, there, there's always the issue of scale, and the bigger the landscape that you can restore, the the, the better, the the, yeah. the more the, the more resilient the overarching system becomes. Mm -hmm. But we have to be also realistic in that there is many different functions in that landscape, and in a way, you're you're making a, a, a jigsaw puzzle, and you can do a bit here and a bit there, but in, you have to put all of those in an overarching vision and view. And that that is where we where we say that okay, where are the chances and the opportunities for that? So that is a I, I think it is something that you have to do together with stakeholders. Like I am also uh, been working in the EcoShape Consortium, that's a, a Dutch consortium for building with nature projects. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 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 dredging industry in there and consultants and research institutes like Deltaris, and then it's it done together with the governments and other stakeholders. And we're working together towards saying, okay, also universities, like, okay, what do we need to know for really making this successful? And six enablers were defined. And these enablers, because you can talk about like, yeah. what's the barrier and why don't we manage to do this? But it, I like to talk about these six enablers because it's also the way forward, right? And um, it's good to know them because it's like system understanding and understanding which measure you can do where. But it's also about understanding your stakeholders and how do you get your stakeholders together and having them all on board. Not only mm -hmm. is a few, but make sure that everyone is there. And at the same time, not only think about the system understanding now, but also if you implement a measure, so there's the maintenance part and the monitoring. It's like, what do you, what do you need to do to ensure the longevity of a measure? So that is the, the maintenance and monitoring. And then there's there's three more. There's one on institutional embedding. So who is responsible? How do you make it work? From, and then there's about the finance, as you were saying, mm -hmm. and doing that with finances from different sources and make make the business case work. And then there's capacity building as the sixth one. Just to people need to understand. And when mm -hmm. they understand, and when they under the, the, also the importance of, for example, biodiversity, if it's not their main, uh, like education aspect, yeah, then it then they will start to 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 start to think about it because it might just not be on their radar. So you it see is. that for the six enablers, there's only two: the system understanding and the monitoring that are actually say the more technical ones, and the other ones are very much about the people. And the, and the finance, the enabling environment, as we call it. That's very interesting, this point, um, because we discuss uh, in this Eco Advance project a lot about the role of people, individuals, even the context. Let's say sometimes you find NGOs, sometimes you find uh, people in administration, at least sometimes even one single person that is very passionate. You know, this person wants to change something in the river close by or whatever. So would you think um, that the role of individual persons is also important or would you think it's more the collective of different groups? That means someone Probably to... Probably a combination. You, you do need your local heroes, right? So exactly, that's what I want to can really help. And um, it can, we see that some of our more successful ones are really about also a, a few individuals that help driving such processes forward. Mm -hmm. I see the sun is in my face. I just quickly go and close the curtain. Yes, yeah, sure. Do that. Do that. <clears throat> Do that. <clears throat> Sorry about that, but this is better. I was not no, no, seeing. No, we can it. cut it. It's no problem. Yeah, we can cut it. Out. Yes, definitely. No, but. Yeah, so uh, we Go yeah. ahead. Great, no, no, just the question was uh, how you would consider the importance of individual people steering a process, having a passion to realize this restoration, to push it forward. What would you think is the importance of such a person? Well, you, you need you need someone who is able to speak up to, and to, to vocalize like what is the benefit to other people so that the other people can also get on board and this onboarding is an important process and we need to realize that it takes time the whole stakeholder dialogue it takes time it's not something that you just do as a side job it is a is a core job of any restoration project to do it together with the people and we see in merlin for example there's many examples where this can take like at least one third of your project so to say 
it is it, it is that dialogue that makes a success. And for that, there's a few people who need to just drive that dialogue and bring people together. And then it's the whole group that comes to the conclusion, this is the way forward. Based on your long and very intensive experience, Alice, um, if you would if you would uh, say the enablers, which I like very much, not yeah. the challenges and the obstacles, yeah. Um, how would you put then the enablers to the forefront? In that sense, how can you support enabling parameters to get forward? Is it a matter of the scientists to support this, or a joint work with administration with the public? If you think also on the missions like in Danny Fall again, to to say, yeah. do we need the people in this mission type of approach to get them on board? Also, also in other projects, stakeholders. How how would you see these enablers to 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 push them forward? Well, the, the sixth enabler that we were talking about is capacity building, right? Yeah. And that yeah. is capacity building basically on all the five of them, and um and that is I think the one that we sometimes forget about because. If you don't know, then you will not you don't you will not include something, and that is not by 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 a lack of willingness. It's often just a lack of know how that people might not include something, and um. So, is there anything that is particularly important? In, I think that all of the different enablers are important in that one. There's not one that's more important than another one. So we have to work on all the yeah. one at the same time. Yeah. Now, uh, I see a lot of discussions in, in our country, but in general, I think on, on this point, we have climate change now, we have all these crisis situations, um, maybe river situation is not so important, we have other things to go for, to have peace and all this, and also climate change on top of it. Um, isn't it also a chance in that sense to say, okay, we have climate change, which is really bad and we have all this land use change with this with taking away of the floodplains and all of this isn't it also a chance to say maybe because you mentioned the green deal to to reverse that and say okay maybe we can get green jobs out of it so that the same consulting companies that did the regulation before now they do the restoration the same construction yeah. companies does now the restoration work can we not prove in a way against the politicians or in, in favor of the politicians, whatever, that they should invest in this because it's also a motor for the economy. Sounds a little bit strange, but how would you see this point? Well, I, I, I see that this is already happening. I, I see that like in the EcoShade Consortium, this is really key because we're doing this because the, also the, 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 the industry sees that there is a there is a market for this and they, they are looking for which knowledge that they can use in, in, in making nature restoration or um, ecosystem friendly implementation of other works mm -hmm. part of their core business. So and also with the new responsibilities that that, that they have on uh, sustainability reporting, this is also just driving the thinking of okay, how are we going to make a, a good sustainability report and how do we do that and, and how can we be a forefront runner in that? It is also part of, yeah, showing how good you are in that perspective. So that makes it really nice to really um, also think together on like also for us scientists and how can we help industry in that manner? How can we bring the good solutions to the table so that we, like for example, um, seeing that like even even within even within Deltares we are discussing with with our en engineering colleagues that might not necessarily be working on biodiversity what biodiversity brings in terms of their projects and from that they can take it forward to their clients as well now if you would have uh, a few wishes let's say to suggest to your government uh, or to the european commission or to any other government or pay river basin authority um, for which you would say uh, do this uh, if possible in order to improve uh, the situation or to enable a more and more successful restoration project. Uh, what would you suggest to those people? Yeah, governments and governments have their own role to play in this game, right? And I think that they are doing already quite a lot. And the Green Deal is a really helpful instrument in that. So for Europe, that, that really helps us forward. And also that we see how this is then translated into legislation. That is on the one hand, that's, the, that's like the, the sticks in a way, right? The legislation is the sticks, but you can also have carrots. So it's also about how can you help people 
in moving forward? What are the what are the incentives that you can bring, for example, in terms of uh, blue green services or uh, like financing for nature restoration? What what is there? But also, how can you do that together with other types of financing instruments? I, and I think that governments they they do have their role to play, but they they're not the only ones in the game. We're all in that game together. Exactly. Maybe to, to come to an end of the very interesting talk. Um, so in summary, um, what are your key messages for those facing a restoration challenge? What would you recommend in a summary form? Yeah, well, perhaps there's there's one thing that, that we need to, that, that, that I, we didn't talk about so much yet. And that is that I do see that there is sometimes um, restoration efforts trying to be initiated from the single point of restoration as such. And by say a team that is mainly consisting of people that are working in the restoration field from say an ecology point of view and this is really uh, i mean this is also necessary but we do see in the merlin project for example that it would help if these teams widen their scopes and that they start including experts on for example communication uh, stakeholder engagement on financing on perhaps even uh, like the water management part as from the water quantity part so if you broaden your teams, um, you can you can reach a wider group of potentially willing stakeholders to help you realize that goal in restoration. And that I found was a really interesting insight. And by using the word nature-based solution, it almost sometimes seems that suddenly people wake up and they, they say like, oh yeah, but then it also brings benefit to me. So then I am willing to think about it and I want to think with you along. So if you're working in that field of restoration, I would really recommend to think about that wider group of people that you can engage with to look for further options and not do it only on as a single as a single person show because that is that is much more challenging than looking for the for the like a wave of people moving a bigger initiative forward. Also very good, very good explanation and input. Would you have a final wish for this interview at least? Or what, what 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 would you want to say, which we didn't touch? Do you have anything you would want to say additionally? Yeah, well, there's there's an, there's there's another thing that we haven't talked about so much, and that is the connection between the river and the and say the, the wider catchment. And the, the 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 aspects of like how is the wider catchment management, what is the water the energy food uh, nexus part in the ecosystems restoration part. So if we're talking about ecosystem restoration from a river perspective, we also need to consider what's happening in the catchment. And is there changes in land use management, for example? How does that going to affect flow of water towards the river as one of the main core mm -hmm. factors in influencing what's happening in the river system or what's happening in terms of population growth? And do they demand more energy? Do we need to uh, and more drinking water, and where do we get that drinking water from, and that energy production, and these are, it, it does make it much more complicated, but it does, it does prove that this is the reality that we're currently working with, and that, and that we need to consider, like, okay, how is our landscape, our carrier for all of these different ecosystem services? And so uh, thinking more in terms of ecosystem services as well, and what does the ecosystem provide and how can we quantify or uh, make it specific in what that is, that does help in a dialogue as well. That was a very important addition. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> at the end, uh, very, very good. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the talk with you, Elise. I think it was really very inspiring, very yeah. good as always to talk to you. And I thank you very much for the interview. And I'm looking forward to see you again, Alice.